Good evening and welcome to our live national CME organized by the cataract subspecialty of the College of Ophthalmologists. I'm Pham Han Mo, chairman of the cataract subspecialty College of Ophthalmologists. Before we begin, I just want to highlight to use a few of the housekeeping rules, which is currently reflected on the screen. All participants will be muted to enable the speaker to present without interruptions and to prevent uh, unnecessary feedback. This webinar will be recorded. For local doctors, please note that you will be accorded one CME points if you complete the whole uh, event. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We will also be addressing some of the questions received earlier via email. There's a button at the bottom which you can click and you can send your session via, via, via the Q&A options at the bottom of the screen. Okay, today, we are pleased to have with us Dr. John Wong to deliver the lecture, My Fellowship Year, Innovation in Cataract Management from Israel and Germany. Dr. John Wong is a consultant with the National Healthcare Group Eye Institute at Tan Tock Seng Hospital. He completed his ophthalmology specialist training in 2016 and underwent further subspecialty training overseas from 2019 to early 2020, funded by the Health Manpower Development Plan Award. He completed an observership in the assessment of quality of vision and lens pathology at Heidelberg University Eye Clinic at the David, also the David Apple Laboratory in Germany. This was followed by a 12 month fellowship in anterior segment and lens fixation surgery at Mir Medical Center, Israel. Dr. Wong is passionate about complex anterior segment and intraocular lens fixation surgery. His other clinical interests include premium intraocular lenses and general ophthalmology. Dr. Wong, please. Okay, I'm just trying to share my screen now. Thank you, Dr. Pham, for chairing the session and the kind introduction. A very good evening to everyone in attendance. Welcome to this national CME session. I would like to thank the College of Ophthalmologists for giving me the opportunity to talk about my overseas experience. So as a member of the TTSH Ophthalmology, Cataract and Anterior Segment team, I underwent further training in Israel and Germany for a total of 13 months as part of my HMDP to gain further experience in areas relevant to my subspecialty. This is the overview of my sharing. I will be highlighting differences in routine cataract surgery between the local Singapore practice and my overseas training centers. I will then discuss some innovations in lens fixation uh, that I was uh, exposed to during my time overseas and also some aspects of the laboratory research that I was involved in. My time in Germany was spent in a center that uh, did a lot of uh, intraocular lens trials, and therefore the assessment of uh, not just visual equity, but quality of vision was a big part of the trial. So I'll be sharing the assessments done by the center. And lastly, I'll be talking about some aspects of life, uh, especially with regard to Israel, because it is a country that is in constant uh, unrest. So let me first uh, introduce uh, Israel uh, just a bit. So it is a, uh, it, is, it is a country in the Middle East with a population of 8.5 million people. It has a very heterogeneous population with Jewish people returning from Europe, Africa, the Americas, Asia to take up citizenship back in Israel. So actually any person who can prove that his or her mother is uh, Jewish can take up citizenship in Israel. 
Uh, there's actually a very high prevalence of pseudo-exfoliation syndrome in Israel, and this was to my benefit because more PXS would mean more patients with uh, problems of subluxated cataracts and lenses, and there was a high volume of such surgeries which was relevant to my training. Israel is a relatively young country that claimed independence in 1948, and it has a young population with a median age of 30.3 years old. The first language in Israel is Hebrew, both uh, written and spoken, and this was one of the main barriers uh, that I faced uh, during my time there because the majority of the elderly patients which uh, constitute our patient load uh, only spoke uh, Hebrew. Uh, even if they spoke English, uh, their English was learned from uh, movies and TV, so there was a very limited amount of uh, spoken English uh, among the older population. Now for the younger population, um, they do take English lessons, but it is not compulsory. It is more of like a third language. And most of the young Israelis only start learning uh, English at the age of 10. So apart from Hebrew, uh, the common spoken languages there are Arabic and uh, Russian because they have a huge uh, Russian immigrant population. Some of us may know Israel, uh, it is nicknamed as the startup nation because it is a relatively innovative economy and country. Uh, and so in a global uh, competitiveness uh, report in 21.7 and 21.8, you can see that Israel is ranked highly in terms of innovation. So this was also to my benefit because they were relatively innovative in their healthcare management as well as some of their surgical techniques. This is the map of Israel uh, seen on the right side of the screen. So the land of Israel is highlighted in yellow and it's a relatively small country where one can uh, drive from the north to the south in about five hours and cross from east to west in about an hour. The most developed part of the country is the central region where the major cities of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are located. I'd like to bring your attention to the areas highlighted in green. Now, these are the Palestine uh, territories and in particular uh, Gaza, which is at the southwest corner of the map. So frequently, we get rocket attacks uh, from Gaza, and Gaza is situated just 70 kilometers from the central region. So we're definitely within an uh, easy striking range uh, of the rocket. So I was trained, I, I underwent my training in four uh, locations. Most of my time was spent in Mir Medical Center, which is a smaller uh, hospital, 20 minutes drive to the north of Tel Aviv, and it is a popular training uh, hospital. I also attend uh, Eintal Eye Center, which is the largest private ophthalmology center in Israel. And I also visit Tel Aviv Sorosky Medical Center and More Imaging Center. Uh, these are all located in the right smack in the center of uh, Israel, uh, in Tel Aviv. I mean. So I chose Israel as uh, my main fellowship location uh, because I was promised a good volume of hands-on uh, surgery. And other members of my team had already uh, undergone their fellowship in Australia and Canada. So I was very fortunate to have Professor Ehud Asya as my mentor. Uh, he is a very passionate teacher and very patient and innovative as well. So he was the past director of the Department of Ophthalmology at the department where I was attached to for 25 years. Having stepped down as a director, he still maintained his position as director of the Center of Applied Eye Research. He therefore runs the laboratory in the center, and uh, there was a good uh, volume of laboratory research. He's also director of the Eintal Eye Center, which is the largest in Israel. And uh, he holds patents for a few uh, devices and procedures, uh, first of which is the APX, which, which is the Asia Pupil Expander. If you look at the top right-hand corner of your screen, you will see the Asia Pupil Expander, which is an alternate device used for dilatation of poorly dilating pupils intraoperatively. I will show the use of this device in a later video. He also holds a patent for the Asia Anchor, seen in the bottom right corner of the screen. This is a device used for fixation and stabilization of capsular bags that have uh, existing zonulitis and it is an alternative to uh, devices that we, we may be more familiar with, such as the Sioni ring or the capsular tension segment. 
He also pioneered the class procedure, which is a glaucoma procedure where one uses a CO2 laser to create a sclerectomy, and it is more commonly performed in China. He delivered the Arthur Lim Lecture in APA CRS 2012, and more recently, during the year of my fellowship, a Binkos Medal Lecture at ESCRS 219, and he has more than 200 publications. I just want to share a picture of my staff pass, and you can see it's all written in Hebrew, my name and my, uh, my title. So actually my staff pass is something that I carry every day, but I actually can't read it myself. So for the numbers of the year, I was involved in a total of uh, 955 surgeries. Most of them were cataract surgeries, uh, phaco emulsifications, and femtosecond laser-assisted cataract surgeries. There were smaller amounts of uh, minimally invasive glaucoma procedures such as eye stents and also a few corneal transplants and procedures. Among the 955 surgeries, uh, there was a good number of uh, complicated anterior segment surgeries that involved subluxated cataracts, intraocular lenses, and eyes that required iris repair. There were a total of 118 cases. I was involved in a training residence for their FACO list. It was a reciprocal relationship because I needed the residents to translate for me during surgery, and therefore uh, I also took them through their cases. I co-authored eight papers during the one year, four of which have been published, and I attended four conferences, the ESCRS in uh, Paris 21.9, the other three are local conferences. So I'd like to start by sharing uh, some of the differences in routine phaco emulsification uh, uh, in Singapore as compared to my training centers. So the first obstacle I faced was that most patients do not speak good English, and even the scrub nurses, the older ones, do not speak much English as well. So there was difficulty getting patients to co cooperate, and I had to adapt by learning some basic Hebrew phrases to get patients to cooperate. This problem of uh, language was further uh, exacerbated by the fact that there was no routine uh, sedation for 95% of our cataract surgeries, and there is actually no anesthetist on standby unless patients are put in a general anesthesia list in the main operating theater. We also only perform intracameral anesthesia. Uh, no, blocks, uh, no blocks such as peribulbar blocks or retrobulbar blocks are performed unless we deem the patient to be uncooperative on table. All surgeons are trained to sit superiorly during phaco and cataract surgery, unlike most Singaporeans which uh, sit temporally. And all cases are performed with the use of an anterior chamber maintainer. I will show a video of this and then further discuss why an anterior chamber maintainer is used for all cases. A minor inconvenience is that all surgeons in Israel are trained to operate the phaco foot pedal with their left foot, while the microscope pedal is on their right foot. This is opposite to what they're used to, and it was something that I couldn't get used to. So in between cases, or it's actually within a case when we had to switch surgeons, there was this inconvenience of having to switch the microscope pedal and the phaco pedal position. Of note, also no one in Israel uses the phaco machine for irrigation and aspiration. And all of this is done, uh, cortical removal is done manually using an anise cannula. Hydro polish is also performed for every patient. Hydro polish is a step in surgery where one introduces a small amount of uh, BSS into the capsular bag using a cannula and a syringe. And this is for the purpose of dislodging uh, cortical remnants that would otherwise be left uh, unseen at the fornices of the capsular bag. And this is believed to be able to decrease uh, posterior capsular opacity rate. And in general, patients are very receptive to monovision in Israel. I will now show this video of a routine surgery. So for all cases, we actually start with making three paracentesis in the eye with the inferior paracentesis used for insertion of the anterior chamber maintainer. So the anterior chamber maintainer is the first device that we put into the eye to maintain stability of the anterior chamber throughout surgery. I've skipped the phaco part because it is similar to what we're used to. This is the part of irrigation and aspiration where we use this cannula called the anise cannula attached to a syringe. 
and uh, negative pressure is generated by pulling back, back on the syringe uh, plunger. And the Israelis believe this is a more sensitive and more uh, controlled way of removing cortical material. This is the process of uh, hydro polish, where we introduce small squishes of BSS into the capsular bag to further dislodge cortical material to decrease uh, long-term uh, posterior capsule opacity rate. After implantation of the lens, we then hydrate the wounds, and the last step of the surgery would be to remove the anterior chamber maintainer. So it's not too different from what we're used to, just a few minor steps. And I'd like to discuss here why an anterior chamber maintainer is used. Uh, so this is culturally how they, are, how they were trained, but one of the main reasons was to maintain a stable anterior chamber and intraocular pressure throughout surgery. So this concept is illustrated by the graph on the right side. Let me bring your attention to the topmost graph, which is the, the waveform highlighted in red. Okay? So you can see that for conventional phaco, between each phase of cataract surgery, when the main probe is removed from the eye, we then lose our infusion. And therefore, there is a drop in intraocular pressure and therefore loss of the anterior chamber as well. Within each phase of surgery, you can see that there are fluctuations in intraocular pressure and therefore chamber stability um, with conventional FACO. Now, there are, tech, there are advances in our FACO machines where we now have machines that have active fluidics or adaptive fluidics, and this is seen in the blue waveform where we are better able to maintain intraocular pressure and anterior chamber stability within each phase of surgery, uh, and therefore it makes surgery much safer with less fluctuations in the anterior chamber. However, in between the phases of surgery, we still have this drop in anterior chamber stability and intraocular pressure. Now on the bottom part of the screen, we see the green waveform, and this is actually surgery when using an anterior chamber maintainer. You can see that throughout the phases of surgery, we have a very stable intraocular pressure and therefore very stable cham chamber and therefore surgery is much safer. So what this translates to is that in cases of uh, intraoperative complications such as PCR and zonulysis, uh, because of the constant pressure within the eye, there is less risk of vitreous prolapse into the anterior chamber and a less chance of having to manage this prolapse vitreous. This is a paper on hydropolish, which just highlights uh, what I showed earlier. And it shows that hydropolish is a safe technique uh, to use to eradicate residual cortical fibers. And it's believed that we can decrease PCO rate uh, with uh, using hydropolish for all our patients. The next video is to illustrate the use of the RCR pupil expander. So this is an eye with previous uh, uveitis. You can see a poorly dilating pupil, and after we've stretched the pupil and removed the inflammatory membrane, we then want to deploy our two uh, pupil extenders. So we deploy this by making two paracentesis about 180 degrees apart at the horizontal axis of the eye. The first device is inserted into the eye uh, with the proprietary forceps, and you can see that the forceps actually um, hold the uh, devices very stably. The leading edges of the device is designed to engage the pupil margin effectively, thus providing good pupil dilation. So it is an alternative device to what we are more used to, such as uh, iris hooks or actually uh, other ring uh, expanders, such as the Malugan ring. Uh, once the device is implanted, you can see that the rest of the surgery proceeds uh, uh, routinely, here we are removing the cataract using a stop and chop technique. Personally, I feel that uh, this device is good for routine cases. It serves its purpose of dilating the pupil well. However, in more complex uh, cases where there is more maneuvering required in the anterior chamber, sometimes the limbs of the device can get in the way. This is removal of the pupil expanders. 
and we remove using it using the same four steps to close the devices and uh, simply remove, uh, remove them by pulling them out of the eye. So I'd like to talk about lens fixations next. So in the first four months of my fellowship, we performed uh, fixations using more traditional, uh, well-known techniques. And this in included fleural fixation with 9 proline or Gore-Tex sutures, iris fixation with 9 or 10 proline sutures, glued IOL and Yamane uh, techniques. After four months, we had noticed that a Brazilian surgeon by the name of Canabrava had uh, pioneered a technique of uh, sterile fixation using 5O proline. So we adapted his technique and then practiced his techniques uh, in our lab on pig's eyes. And then we were able to expand the use of this technique uh, using 6O proline instead on uh, our patients. Throughout the rest of my surgery, we performed this technique uh, when we had suitable patients and we collected about 30 to 40 cases which we submitted to, uh, we wrote up two papers and submitted them to JCRF and they have since been accepted. So I'll be sharing videos of this uh, technique. So this is the first paper and the first paper talks about the use of 6O proline uh, scleral fixation in cases of aphakia, in fixation of capsular stabilizing devices and also an aniridia implant. This paper should be published within the next two months. So I'll firstly show the video of this technique in a fake here. So we can see an uh, eye with a very mature cataract here, and actually there is fairly extensive uh, zonulysis as seen from the phacodonesis. One method of managing this would be try to try to preserve the capsule, but we opted to perform an ICCE for this patient via a scleral tunnel, and then managing the a fake here with a six row proline scleral fixation. So ICC is performed with a sheet glide to support the under, underside of the lens. And once an anterior vitrectomy is done, we then prepare the lens. So here we are using an Alcon one-piece hydrophobic lens where we pass the needle and suture 6O proline through the optic haptic junction of the intraocular lens. We then create a flange which will uh, prevent the suture from slipping through. And we now have a modified intraocular lens with pseudo haptics for us to perform fixation. We pass these sutures through a needle that is inserted 2 mm from the limbus of the eye. And we do this uh, 180 degrees apart. This provides us with two point fixation. Once we have achieved this, we will then push the intraocular lens into the anterior chamber and by applying tension on the two sutures, it allows us to centralize the intraocular lens. We then cut the suture and then create flanges to help us fixate the intraocular lens. One advantage of this technique is that we can easily adjust the tension of the sutures by repeated cutting and flange creation. We have to ensure that the flange is not too large. If possible, it should be small enough to sit intrasclerally. If it's not possible to sit intrasclerally, then it should be uh, completely tucked under the conjunctiva and the tenon capsule to prevent risk of a subsequent exposure. So this is the end of a case where we have a relatively well-centered intraocular lens. I'll next show the technique, uh, similar technique that we use for a capsular anchor. This is a patient that suffered uh, iatrogenic uh, uh, zonulysis. You can see the inferior 180 uh, capsular bag is collapsing on itself. And we reinflate the bag and check the anterior chamber for any vitreous. Once clear of vitreous, we then prepare our capsular stabilizing device. So this is the Asia anchor. We are passing the suture through the eyelet and creating flange on one side first to prevent the suture from slipping out of the anchor. We then want to pass the suture through the sclera for fixation. So we insert our needle on the inferior aspect of the eye, 2 mm from the limbus. We thread our suture, free end of the suture through the needle externalize the suture above the sclera. 
and we can then uh, implant our capsular stabilizing device. So the lateral limbs of the device are used to engage the uh, anterior CCC rim. And once we are confident that it has engaged well, we can then apply tension to the suture to centralize the capsular bag and to fixate the capsular bag to the sclera. The suture is cut as seen in previous videos and the flange created. We then inject our intraocular lens. And once the lens is in the eye, we are able to judge the centration of the bag and the lens better, and we can make further adjustments uh, to the centration. And always ensure that the flange is uh, well tucked under the sinons and the conjunctiva. This is the end of the surgery. So this is a picture of a post-op picture of the patient at one month post-op. We can see that it is a quiescent eye with a relatively well-centered intraocular lens. The flange, we can see uh, the inferior sclera, and there is a lack of any injection or inflammation in the area. So what we notice with, with this technique is that uh, because there, we do not need to cut conjunctiva, patients generally rehabilitate quite well, quite quickly, and most patients are actually quiescent at one week post-op and they do not complain of much irritation. The second part of our paper was focused on using a 6-0 proline flange technique for repositioning of subluxated intraocular lenses. Uh, so in Israel, it is actually more common to reposition lenses instead of uh, to explant and then to implant and fixate a new lens. So I'll illustrate this in the next video. So this is a 100-year-old patient with an inferiorly uh, subluxated uh, lens uh, capsular bag complex. What we saw was the summering ring at the pupil. After proper markings of our sites of uh, uh, where the needle is supposed to pass, what we're trying to do here is to loop uh, one strand of 6O proline around one of the haptics of this uh, one-piece uh, lens. So we pass the needle under and then the next pass will be above the haptic to loop the suture around and then we perform the same procedure on the other haptic, the intraocular lens. Once we are confident that we have looped around both haptics, we can then adjust the tension of the sutures to center the intraocular lens. We also performed uh, this same uh, technique uh, on a patient that had traumatic aniridia and aphakia. So we implanted an aniridia uh, implant uh, that has a central uh, optic as well as a peripheral rim of artificial iris. And we used the flange technique. We were able to achieve good centration and a relatively acceptable uh, color match between both eyes for this patient. So some of the advantages of this technique would be that uh, conjunctival peritomy uh, need not be performed and therefore patients recover faster and surgery is also uh, quicker. We feel that it is technically simpler because of the inherent stiffness of the 6O proline. It allows for better control within the anterior chamber of the eye. You saw us pass uh, sutures through the anterior chamber to dock into the needle. And most of the time, this could be achieved without the need for any intraocular instruments or intraocular forceps. More importantly, the thicker suture would uh, resist uh, degradation. We know that 10 o proline, when used for fixation, usually doesn't last for more than 10 years in patients. And by using a thicker suture with this technique, we can avoid repeating, having to repeat surgery in such patients. It is not a perfect technique and uh, further refinement needs to be done. So some negatives would be that uh, we are worried about conjunctival erosion, especially when the flange is uh, too large and not intraspleral. So we're always very careful to tuck the flange under the, the sinon. 
and also IOL centration to be studied as for all uh, newer techniques. Uh, so we're not saying that this is a best technique, uh, but it is something new as an, and it can serve as an alternative uh, for some patients. Next, I'd like to talk about some of the lab research that I was involved in. So uh, because we housed the lab and uh, there were many startups that were eager to work with us, uh, there were a lot of new devices that they brought to test in our laboratory. Uh, one of the devices that we uh, implanted in animals was a Visidome add-on accommodative intraocular lens. Uh, so this is an add-on lens um, that we implant into the sulcus. You can see the design of the lens here. It has a central optic and is connected by two bridges to a peripheral ring. Now this device actually contains a fluid within the whole device and uh, the design is such that we believe that when a patient is trying to accommodate the contraction of the ciliary uh, muscles will then squeeze on the peripheral ring causing the center optic to thicken and therefore this provides the um, accommodation, uh, this provides the near ad for the patient. So we implanted this in pig's eyes and then we performed UVM to study the position and the behavior of this lens uh, in this eye. A large part of my time was spent on the concept of uh, viscofluid. Uh, so what uh, we're trying to achieve here is that we all know that uh, when performing cataract surgery or intraocular surgery, VSS and viscoelastics are essential components for safe surgery. So we were trying to combine uh, both the VSS and the viscoelastic into a viscofluid and we believe that by uh, performing surgery uh, under viscofluid, we can provide a longer, longer lasting uh, endothelial protection and make surgery safer overall. So I'd like to show this video uh, showing the difference in turbulence of cataract fragments where we operate in VSS as compared to operating in viscofluid. So this is FACO in a VSS and um, we're facoing in this artificial anterior chamber, which is the sleeve of the, the faco. And you can see the very fast turbulent uh, movements of the uh, cataract particles when facoing in DSS. But when facoing in a visco fluid, you can see a gentler, slower turbulent action. And therefore, it might be beneficial for the patient's endothelium. However, in this video, you will see uh, one of the uh, setbacks that we had that you can see that the chamber repeatedly collapses because the more viscous fluid enters the eye slower and therefore we are unable to maintain a stable chamber when we use visco fluid uh, with higher settings of uh, aspiration and vacuum. So this is a graphical representation of what, we're trying, what I was trying to illustrate. So um, we are plotting the flow rate on the y-axis against different sizes of uh, anterior chamber maintainer. You can see the blue line, which represents DSS, has the highest flow. But once we switch to increasingly viscous uh, fluids within the eye, the flow rate into the eye would be much, much lower. So the company that um, we were working with uh, was trying to de design a standalone pump to increase infusion rates into the eye to maintain a stable chamber for us to operate uh, safely. And it is still in the process of uh, further investigation. So not all of my uh, lessons were learned in hospital. So there were a lot of uh, life lessons learned outside hospital, especially in an environment like Israel. Uh, one of the most common questions that I get from family and friends when they found out that I was going to Israel was that uh, if it was a safe, was it a safe country? Uh, was, it, was, was I putting myself at risk? Um, so day to day, it is relatively safe. You do not actually feel much uh, danger. The only difference is you get regular back checks when you're trying to enter government buildings or hospitals or even shopping malls. And sometimes they also request to verify identification. Uh, but there were times of uh, danger that I experienced that I will share here. So this is a newspaper article published on the 25th of uh, March last year. This is one month after I arrived in Israel. And um, what happened was that for the first time in the city that I was living in, uh, there was a rocket attack. So at 5 a.m. in the morning, the rocket sirens sounded 
And after 10 minutes, we could hear an explosion nearby. Uh, the rocket had actually landed about five kilometers from where I stayed, and the casualties were conveyed to uh, the hospital that I was being trained at. Uh, so I remember this morning very vividly as I was walking to hospital, uh, Dr. Farm was actually texting me, uh, checking if I was all right. And he was actually trying to calm me down because it was a day that I still had to perform surgery on my patient. Uh, later during uh, fellowship, uh, there were days where the rocket attacks got more intense. So these were three days where uh, Gaza fired over 400 rockets at Israel. And um, uh, during these three days, uh, some schools and services were closed. Uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, you see this app that we all have on our phones. So this is a red alert app uh, that actually warns us of rocket attacks and uh, where the rockets will be landing. And during these three days, uh, my phone was constantly ringing. Uh, however, Israelis are very used to this uh, text and unrest, and therefore life actually more or less goes on. We go on, we, we carry on with our work, with our surgery. Um, yeah. I also got to experience a few uh, nursing strikes uh, because nurses frequently protest about the poor working conditions and heavy caseloads. And um, that apparently happens uh, once, twice a year. And in this instance, uh, my, my surgical list for the day had to be cancelled because there was uh, no longer any scrub nurse to assist me for my surgery. And there were also other protests involving uh, Ethiopian Jews with uh, the rest of the Israelis. So uh, this experience uh, taught me to appreciate uh, Singapore much, much more. I was born and I grew up in Singapore, which is a constantly very peaceful, very prosper prosperous country. And only when I was put in an, another environment did I appreciate my country uh, better. Uh, it was not all doom and gloom. So apart from uh, the unrest, uh, there was good teaching. I learned a lot of things. And uh, I got to visit Palestine. I wanted to cross the border to see how life on the other side was like. So this is on the uh, picture on my left. And the picture on the right shows me in Nazareth, uh, which is where Jesus grew up uh, for believers. I'll next move on to my time in uh, Germany. So I spent about a month in Germany uh, trying to uh, learn some aspects of quality of vision assessment. So my time was spent in Heidelberg, which was a beautiful university town about 78 kilometers south of Frankfurt. It has a population of 160,000 and it houses uh, Heidelberg uh, University, which is the oldest uh, university in Germany founded in 1386. It is home to 56 Nobel laureates. So I was under the supervision of Professor Gert Alford. So um, Heidelberg University Eye Clinic, uh, they firstly housed the David J. Apple Lab for Vision Research. So this was a center that does extensive research on all ophthalmic devices, uh, mostly in relation to cataract surgery. So they do a lot of intraocular lens trials before the lenses are actually made available on the market. They investigate OVDs, IOL injectors, machines, uh, basically any uh, technology related to uh, cataract surgery. It is also home to the biggest library of uh, IOL pathology in the world. So what happens is that if anyone in the world has, uh, for, for instance, an opacified intraocular lens, uh, these uh, explanted lenses can be sent to them where they do extensive testing, including physical, chemical testing. They have an optical bench. They have an electron microscope to do in-depth investigation on uh, IOL pathology. I'd also like to uh, just highlight a few points of FACO in Heidelberg. So we move from one extreme in Israel where there is no sedation to one where more than 50% of uh, cataract surgery is done under general anesthesia. Uh, the reason here is actually just patient preference. Uh, culturally, if the patient requests for general anesthesia, the managing surgeon usually does not deny the patient. And therefore, we have uh, in this center a lot of referrals from the private eye centers where they do not have an anesthetist. They refer these patients to our center uh, to perform cataract surgery under GA. So we actually have two sets of anesthetists per operating room. We have one anesthetist monitoring the patient while surgery is going on, and another two anesthetists in the induction room 
uh, getting ready to put the patient under uh, while the first surgery is going on. Of interest, uh, scrubbing and hand wash is only performed for the first case of the day, and the rest of the cases, we just do an alcohol hand rub. And it is quite routine for myopes who do not uh, have multifocal lenses implanted. They prefer to choose the refractive target as a minus 2.5 diopters for both eyes because uh, I think culturally they enjoy their reading without their glasses and they do not mind wearing glasses for this thing. This was one uh, a project that I got to observe. So this is actually a multi-cert intraocular uh, lens uh, injector. Um, so we, there are two main uh, techniques of uh, injecting a lens. Some surgeons prefer using a screw mechanism to inject the lens, while other surgeons prefer a shooter mechanism where we just push down on the plunger. So this device is a combination of two technologies in one, where we have the screw mechanism seen here on the device for patients, uh, for the surgeons to use. Otherwise, they can simply press down on the plunger to inject the intraocular lens. So how this was investigated was with the use of an endoscope that we put in the anterior chamber. The video here shows the endoscopic view of uh, the uh, injector being uh, inserted into the wound, and we can see the uh, injection of the intraocular lens. So we are trying to compare both the screwing mechanism and the shooter mechanism. This is another view uh, called the Apple Miyake view, where we observe the insertion of the lens through the undersurface of the eye. And I thought this was pretty interesting and innovative for us to uh, compare injection of uh, intraocular lenses. Another product that was uh, being uh, investigated then, then was the Vivio, uh, Visual Behavior Monitor. So what this is, is a device that patients can clip onto their glasses and patients bring this home for a few days. The device will then monitor and chart the distribution of vis visual distance that patients have throughout the day over a course of few days. The patient then brings the device back and we are able to collect this data. This will help us customize uh, the choice of intraocular lens, uh, especially multifocal lenses, to the patient's uh, visual needs. And by presenting this and discussing with the patients, we can come to a better consensus of the choice of multifocal lens used for this patient. Uh, not only does the device chart the visual distance, it also actually charts and records the illumination that the patient is exposed to. Uh, as illumination is still very important, uh, despite patients having multifocal lenses, they need good illumination. So this is further information for us to use with regards to counselling of patients. This device has also been used uh, fairly extensively in pediatric myopia research, and uh, children uh, bring this home and they are able to chart their visual uh, behaviour uh, for use in myopia studies. So as mentioned earlier, being a center that has a lot of IOL trials, a lot of uh, uh, quality of vision assessment is being done for patients pre and post operatively. And I got to observe uh, the technicians as well as the residents uh, collecting all this data. So we have both subjective and objective uh, assessments. Uh, the, the focus curves are very routinely done for trial patients. Uh, of note, uh, we not only chart the patient's near visual equity, but we want a better quantitative assessment of the patient's uh, near uh, visual uh, ability. So we actually measure their reading speed using a Salzburg reading desk. This is, this is the device seen on the bottom right corner of the screen. The technician is on one side, the patient sits on the other side, and we are able to choose a font size of a, a font, different font size for the patient to read. It is a smart system where the system will pick up the reading speed of the patient as well as pick up the number of reading errors that the patient makes. So this gives a much better uh, objective uh, measurement of the patient's uh, reading ability. There's a lot of tests on uh, visual quality, uh, such as the use of HD analyzer, which is fairly widely available now, uh, contrast measurements, as well as a glare and a halo simulator. Yep. So I've come to the end of my uh, talk. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some people in my department, 
firstly, Professor Wong Hong Kim and Professor Vernon Yong for, for supporting uh, my fellowship and my HMBT application. I'd like to uh, give thanks to uh, Dr. Pham, Dr. Yo Tung Kwan, and Dr. Don Peck uh, for uh, teaching me and letting me join them in the operating rooms before I went for fellowship. fellowship. In particular, Dr. Pham for helping me link up with Professor Alfred so that I could go for my observership and uh, Dr. Yo Tung Kwan for linking me up with uh, my Israeli mentor through uh, Professor Graham Barrett. So thank you very much. I'll be happy okay, to thank take you. any questions. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for sharing with us your experiences. Now it's time for discussion and some Q&A session with our panelists. I noticed we already have a few questions. We will address some of these questions, but if there are any more questions, uh, we will be happy to to take them. Now the first question comes from uh, Dr. Ronios. If you use an AC maintainer, does that mean you do not need to use overleaf for all its CCC and IOL implantation? John? Yeah, so that is actually uh, true if uh, one is comfortable with it. So for my mentor, when he performs cataract surgery, he can actually perform the whole surgery without the use of any viscoelastic apart from using a bit of viscoelastic uh, for the cartridge of the lens. Uh, so because you have a stable chamber and a well-inflated bag uh, throughout surgery, uh, even uh, implantation of intraocular lens uh, for that step, you can actually uh, implant it under BSS. Uh, but for me, uh, being someone that has always been trained to use viscoelastic, I never got comfortable to perform it without any uh, viscoelastic and therefore I still persisted in uh, using viscoelastic in all my surgeries there. And uh, this was also the case in all residents. They are still advised to use viscoelastic routinely. But you have done surgery with, uh, with a continuous AC maintainer as well. Yes. So do you find the different in view with and without AC maintainer, the Singapore way of doing and the Israeli way of doing? Honestly, for a routine case, I do not feel that much of a difference in all our routine uh, steps uh, because most of our machines now already have adaptive or active fluidics. The anterior chamber is already very, very stable for us to perform a safe uh, surgery. Uh, the only advantage was that in cases of complications as mentioned earlier, I do notice much, much uh, less incidence of uh, uh, vitreous prolapse. And so that is one benefit, but I don't think it is an essential uh, uh, modification that uh, we should adopt uh, in Singapore, but it is an option. Great. With the French technique so far, have you seen any recurrent IR subluxation? Uh, in the 30 plus cases that we performed, uh, we had one case where there was slippage of the suture and therefore at post-operative uh, day one, uh, we had to go back in to refixate it using the same technique and after that it was fine. Uh, with regards to flange exposure, we actually had one case of exposure um, uh, in a very elderly patient and we actually offered her um, a repeat surgery to uh, try to close up the exposure. In view of advanced age, she declined uh, further surgery. And after six months, she actually uh, developed endophthalmitis that we had to uh, treat. So uh, managing the flange is actually very important. We have to ensure that it is very well balanced. Yeah. Okay, with the, with, the, with the slippage, the flange slippage, do you yeah. need to re-fixate the whole thing? I mean, we do the whole thing on the on the on the slip side or you try to salvage mm. what you can? So what we did was to uh, remove the uh, 6 proline on the side that has slipped and then we just repeat the pro pro procedure on uh, the, the haptic that has slipped. Yeah, so we didn't need to do the whole thing for both haptics, we just needed to do it for one side again. Yeah. But, but do you have to retread it with a, with, and we create a, a new flange? Uh, yes, so we remove the first uh, suture because once uh, we shorten the suture, we actually have a 
not much uh, suture to uh, work with anymore. Uh, it was also quite challenging uh, to do without removing the initial suture because the haptic would then be hidden under the iris uh, and uh, we might not be able to see to adjust the position uh, just by trying to salvage it. So we remove the suture and then we use a new uh, a, a, a suture. Yes. There's another question here. This is a mm. question that is going to be more prevailing in the years to come. Yes. When a complication with vitreous loss is, a, is an anterior, uh, is the limbo base anterior retractomy done or is it a past planar anterior retractomy? Um, so this is a highly controversial uh, topic. Uh, during my training there, we did do uh, anterior retractomy uh, through uh, uh, limbo or, or cornea incision. Uh, but there were also some cases that we opted to put in a troca and did uh, uh, the tractomy uh, behind uh, the iris. Uh, physiologically, I think um, if one is trained to do that safely, then uh, cutting and removing uh, vitreous that has collapsed into the anterior chamber through a path planar or path bicata approach is, uh, is better because you're actually pulling the vitreous uh, back into the vitreous cavity and usually I feel that it's uh, cleaner. However, uh, one has to be trained and uh, confident in putting in uh, trocars and then uh, managing the removal of uh, trocars at the end of surgery. So it is an option if we have adequate uh, training. Hmm. Okay, another question on AC maintainer. With the AC maintainer on, do you yes. still have a continuous irrigation on the phaco pro? Um, yes, so uh, we, I still use continuous uh, irrigation, but then the settings of the, the bottle height or the, or the pump settings on the uh, machine can be lowered because you already have an alternate uh, infusion to maintain chamber stability. So in general, the bottle height uh, for the phaco machine is, uh, is lower. Uh, however, um, if you still maintain uh, what you're used to, what happens is that if your, infu if your infusion uh, pressure from the FACO machine is higher than that of the AC maintainer, the AC maintainer will then naturally not flow because the pressure from the other source is higher. But once, uh, at any point in time where the infusion pressure from the uh, FACO machine is uh, uh, lower than that of the AC maintainer, then the AC maintainer infusion will automatically kick in and therefore, we always maintain this positive pressure within the eye. Ah, okay, that's very logical. Now, the slippage of the flange, mm -hmm. was it because the flange was too small? The um, earlier case. Oh, so it actually wasn't a slippage of the flange uh, through the sclera, but I think uh, perhaps the, the suture wasn't looped adequately or close to the optic haptic junction uh, of the lens. And therefore, somehow uh, it just slipped out the, the next day instead of uh, the flange slipping through the sclera. Uh, because this was a relatively new technique, we were more uh, careful and we actually made our flanges a bit bigger uh, to prevent a slippage of the flange through the sclera. And as we did more cases and were more confident, we were then able to create uh, smaller flanges. Oh, okay. So it was a slippage mm. of the haptics from the loop rather yes. than the flange that slipped. Yes, that's right. Mm. Okay. Okay, so I think you mentioned this, but I think so the question is asked, okay, why do they avoid using FACO, FACO uh, IA from the automated FACO? But why do they avoid using automated FACO? Sorry. Uh, so what I was told, is this is just something cultural and what they've always uh, practiced. Um, what the proponents of this, uh, they say that they feel the aspiration uh, better with manual control with their fingers as opposed to uh, using a foot pedal. Uh, I, I disagree with this. I think if you're used to a foot pedal, you, uh, you, you're used to stepping on a foot pedal for irrigation and aspiration, uh, it can be uh, equally sensitive and done very, very carefully. Um, so I don't uh, think there is a significant uh, advantage of using a manual irrigation and 
uh, aspiration. Uh, however, it was not something uh, difficult uh, to get used to. Uh, we, in Singapore, we are used to using a Simcoe cannula for our ETCE cases. So just, this was just a, a minor adjustment. Do you think it's a right foot, left foot, foot thing? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. That's just a matter of getting used to. Okay. Uh, okay. Does the flange cause any foreign body sensation for the patient? Uh, so in almost all our cases, uh, the patients were actually very comfortable and subjectively they do not uh, complain of any foreign body uh, sensation or irritation in their eye. Uh, that is our experience uh, so far. And of course, we still need longer term follow up. Uh, by now, I think most of the patients have passed the six months or one year follow up for the, for the cases that we have included in our two papers. And so far, I have not received any news of uh, a further exposure or flange or patients being very uncomfortable. Actually, this technique is an extension or modification of the Yamane technique, where instead of using the uh, haptic of a 3 piece intraocular lens to create the flange, we just modify it by using a 6 O uh, proline to create the flange. So I think uh, the track record for Yamane is uh, decent with most patients having a good outcome. So I wouldn't expect uh, it to be that different for this uh, modified technique. So what's the outcome of the accommodative IOL? Is there a disclosure problem there? Uh, it's still in the early stages. Uh, it's not been implanted in humans, but it was uh, interesting uh, for me to um, uh, just uh, my exposure there was interesting and it was also interesting uh, to speak to all these uh, startup companies, CEOs, these inventors, uh, asking them how they create devices and then the whole process of bringing it uh, through a development until it is available in the market and it actually takes a lot, a lot of uh, effort. So uh, having spoken to them, uh, I think it was a great opportunity uh, to uh, hear from them and their perspective. Uh, on uh, devices. Mm. Okay, I think we have just time for two last questions. One is, uh, does your does uh, your mentor do any pediatrics cataracts? Any tips or difference in technique from them? Uh, so he does a fair share of uh, pediatric uh, cases. Usually not uh, those below one years old, just a very limited number. But for uh, children. Uh, uh, that are a bit older, uh, uh, toddlers to even teenagers. Uh, we did get a few in my year there. Um, I wouldn't say that there is a great difference to uh, what is uh, published. Uh, essentially, uh, the main issue here would be to create uh, adequately sized uh, posterior PCC and uh, whether to do anterior vitrectomy or to capture the intraocular lens uh, with the posterior PCC. So um, I don't think there are much differences. Uh, however, a lot of this, some of these pediatric cases were also uh, trauma cases. So it was very interesting to see how he uh, managed such cases. Hmm. Okay, the last question, the haptics are left intact, the flange technique, the haptics are left naked, so to speak, without capsular encasement. Are there any issue with irritations on the ciliary body and therefore have a long-term urethes or hemorrhages? Um, so far, we have not experienced uh, UGH in our patients. Now, if you look at, uh, if you can remember the earlier videos when we create the flange on the uh, lens side or on the device side, such as the capsular tension, uh, such as the capsular anchor, we always aim to create the flange on the undersurface of the device or lens. And therefore, this flange within the eye uh, would not then uh, have a mechanical uh, rubbing onto the iris or the ciliary body. Uh, and that was our measure to uh, prevent uh, UGH in such patients. And so far, we have not had reports of uh, UGH. Okay. Okay, so I think the time is up. I want to thank John Wong for giving us a very interesting sessions on his experience, share with us his experience, the differences and the similarity between Israel, Germany and Singapore. I also want to thank everyone for spending the late afternoon here. So I hope you all had an enjoyable uh, session with us. Thank you very much and good evening.
Thank you very much.